Hello, and welcome to this Austec review of education's response to what is arguably the most influential group of technologies of the last half century. The more venerable amongst us may recall the wave of enthusiasm captivating the young, and sometimes not so young, when the first microcomputers appeared around 40 years ago. Education's failure to harness both the enthusiasm and the technology of the time had serious consequences for adult technological literacy and industrial development. In all fairness, often criticised for lack of response to evolving social needs and changing views about content, education has been the punch bag of the partisan and the political over the years. The pendulum of approach swinging periodically and all too frequently between the extremes of back to basics and the holistic. Against this backdrop, highlighting education systemic failure to respond to the rapidly growing importance of electronic control technology will likely be unwelcome and embarrassing in some quarters because the failure was against the tide of youthful enterprise, curiosity and that all-important ingredient, self-motivated learning. What is often difficult to kindle was summarily snuffed out. With enthusiasm came exploration and experiences providing knowledge and understanding about how computers worked and their potential for automatic control. Many young people at that time became truly computer literate, skilled programmers as well as users, with a keen eye for computing's future potential. In this image from 1981, high school students were programming an RML 380Z, an early Zilog Z80 computer, whilst the insert shows junior children with an Acorn BBC Micro. Note the data storage, an audio cassette recorder. This wonderful educational opportunity to bring what was to become a vital group of everyday technologies into the classroom was largely lost. Forty years later, there is a belated attempt to start afresh, but still with no guarantee of success. With computers an integral part of schooling, today's students are, with rare exception, application users rather than writers, having little understanding about how computers work, interact, and often control aspects of the world about them. Understanding what happened in the 40 years that elapsed between that past wave of enthusiasm and the here and now is critical not only to delivering true computer literacy to our students, but also to future industrial innovation and development. This is the story of how curiosity died at the hands of the education system. The importance of electronic control is clear. Technology, technology everywhere. Our lives are tweaked, dominated, entertained, distracted and controlled in ways unimaginable three or four decades ago. Try counting the number of wooden furnishings at home. Then compare them with the number of computer-controlled appliances and other devices. Embodied computers and the electronic systems they control are the new furnishings of everyday life, their creative use, vital survival skills. New crafts, rivalling the traditional in their impact in everyday life, now justifiably vie for an equal place in the education of our young people. Realising potential depends upon fostering, nurturing, encouraging individual creativity and curiosity. I wonder if it's possible to make something that... Creativity underpins our economic future. A creative and responsive workforce in electronic control catalyses investment in what is also a low-carbon footprint endeavour. In a limited sense, young people are electronic technology adepts, yet mostly passive users with no understanding of underlying systems, capabilities and potential. Consequently, they never develop creative system design skills. Try asking, how much memory does your smartphone have? 16 gigs might be a typical answer. So, what's a gig? 
a science student in their mid-teens should recognise gig as a contraction of giga, meaning uh, 10 to the power 9 or 1 followed by 9 zeros. That is, a billion or a thousand million. But wait a moment. A gig of what? Some students might volunteer the full expansion. Gigabyte. OK, what's a byte? Some students will undoubtedly volunteer the correct answer, but they will be few and far between. Not so 40 years in the past, when such terms were frequently considered passwords of peer acceptance. So, the all-important question. Why was the knowledge and understanding so enthusiastically gained 40 years ago, now mostly conspicuous by its absence? Microcomputers sprang into existence following the appearance of the first microprocessors, that is, computer processors, placed on a single chip in the mid-1970s. Atari, Commodore, Amstrad, Acorn, Apple, Sinclair and so on were amongst the early manufacturers, each with their own often religiously dedicated supporters. The early microcomputers were nowhere near as capable as now. At boot or power-up, they typically displayed system text messages followed by a character or so and a flashing cursor called a command prompt. Want to do something? Like run a program or app as they're known these days? Type in the correct command or even the program itself, character perfect. Yes, type. No mice or other pointer devices. No speech input. Such facilities were at least a decade away. How did users know which command to type? No problem. For the face of it, look in the manual. But therein lay a problem. The manuals were often written by technophiles. They may have used English words, but the relationship to the English language often ended right there. If memory serves me correctly, the Commodore PET manual was a newcomer's model of inscrutability. In the Microsoft world, long before Windows, there was MS-DOS, Microsoft's disk operating system, and a baptism of fire for those early into the world of business computing. A colon backslash is the command prompt in this example. And there's a version of it sitting here. It, or something like it, appeared every time the computer was ready to accept a command. Its meaning, you had to look in the manual to find out, is that the computer's working directory, later known as a folder, is the root or main directory on the floppy disk drive identified by the letter A, followed by a colon. No command, no action. Just to help matters along, commands often produced incomprehensible error messages and occasionally inexplicable behaviour. Here the computer has obviously read the contents of drive A, with the command DIR, but when the command is reissued, it says it can't do it. No reason. Completely inexplicable to the user. The first microcomputers may have been truly challenging, but the challenge was welcomed in some quarters, especially relished by armies of youngsters burning the midnight oil to master complexities and show off newfound knowledge to their friends. A large range of platform-specific magazines catered to an army of readers avidly searching for applications of all kinds and, of necessity, the knowledge and understanding to make them work and, later, improve upon. An entire generation of young people became computer savvy. Magazines? At the time, the internet was almost a decade in the future and the web a little more distant. Magazines, books and TV 
for the main sources of information. Learning was forced by circumstance. Very little software was available at that time, and what was was either expensive, or rubbish, or both. Want programmes or applications? Play games! Then, enter the code first. Many of the early microcomputers had a BASIC interpreter. BASIC, which is an acronym, is an English-like computer programming language in which instructions are entered on numbered lines. The interpreter was a built-in program that translated the user's program text line by line into the binary number instructions understood by the computer's microprocessor. Now here is an apology to the cognoscenti, that is an oversimplification, but it will do here. The translation was relatively slow, but well-written basic made programmes readable, understandable. The example here is for the BBC Micro and is from Acorn user October 1987. Programme listings often occupied hundreds of lines. Although entry mistakes were common, there were also learning opportunities. And students learnt a great deal, not just about programming or coding, as it's known these days, but also about their computer's inner workings. In a nutshell, many young people began by thinking the rewards repaid the effort. As they delved further, they grew to enjoy the learning. The BBC Computer Literacy Project of the early 1980s developed a machine ideal for learning programming or coding and electronic control, the previously mentioned Acorn BBC Micro. Few teachers, and judging by what transpired since, no one in government had any idea of the nature and potential of this computer or of the new technology in general. When computers finally made their way into schools, teachers and students became, with entrepreneurial exceptions, application users rather than creators. Scattered across the years and across New Zealand, entrepreneurs and enthusiastic teachers tried, and are still trying, to fill the educational gap, yet, for all the effort, it was too sporadic to reach critical mass. From the late 1970s, enthusiastic teachers convinced by the potential of the new technologies, but sadly scattered across both time and country, enthused, cajoled, implored, and downright begged authorities to take notice, yet, as it turned out, their efforts were stillborn. Working with a mobile laptop network, copper strip technology and computer-assisted design software, these young students experienced and gained skills in basic electricity, electronics and computing. And at the time, 1998, it already seemed too late. At Dunback, a small rural Otago school long since gone, parents, teachers and students experienced electronic control technology. The students now grown, many likely with children of their own, and their children unlikely to experience an updated version of their parents' experience. Still to achieve general uptake within schools, this vitally important group of technologies generally sits on the educational back burner, or rooted out to specialist enclaves where those are available. At this point, I would like to thank Dunback School's teacher principal, Patricia Kay, for her help and encouragement with these sessions so many years ago. Scattered efforts such as these flourished and died across the years and across the country. Motivated, dedicated teachers carried the flame, but not enough to give the technologies the mainstream classroom presence they deserved. Someone once said bringing change in education was akin to herding cats. Truer words have not been spoken when it comes to education's tardy and uninformed response to the now universal technology of electronic control. Yet this was not the fault of the teachers. As will be clear in a moment or two, there was an awful lot to master and much of that 
was outside their experience. Bemused, bewildered and vastly technologically challenged, educational administrators across the board and from the top down dropped the ball. As the generations passed, enthusiasm faded, opportunity was lost and industrial innovation was still born. Almost 40 years after its original computer literacy project, the BBC tried again. A tiny, cheap, single-board computer called the Microbit was launched with massive industry support. Rather more than just a microcontroller, the Microbit, despite its appearance, is actually a complete computer with keyboard input and display. The keyboard admittedly consists of just two buttons or keys, but keyboard nevertheless, and its display a 5x5 five five matrix of LEDs. Very much in keeping with its venerable ancestor, the BBC Micro, the Microbit was also designed from the ground up with a special feature to connect or interface to the outside world through the gold contacts on its edge connector. So far so good. But will it or devices like it ever make its way into classrooms in meaningful numbers, numbers large enough to give widespread electro-technological literacy. New Zealand recently, but belatedly, recognised programming or coding as a core technology skill. Sadly, education administrators clearly still regard the interface electronics and assorted peripherals as an afterthought. And therein lies the problem as this young technologist is discovering in an example chosen as a reasonable objective for Year 11 to Year 13 students. She wants to build an automated greenhouse. A single microbit handles the processing for which she must eventually write the code. This is also the place where the core New Zealand technology curriculum stops. But there's far more to this problem than writing code. The microbit must gather information to control the greenhouse, that is, it must read sensors. The BME 280 combo sensor is an inexpensive $28 or so. There are cheaper options requiring far less programming skill, but this was selected not just because of its quality and performance, but also because, and being the devil's advocate, and to emphasise the curricular point, basic knowledge and understanding of computer communications, in this case I2C, and the binary representation of numbers are essential to requesting and collecting the data. Having sensed the greenhouse environment, the microbit must then control motors to open and close windows and control pumps for irrigation. Precise window positioning might use a servo, configured as a kind of high-precision motor. Temperature control demands heaters, missing from an already crowded diagram, together with monitoring time and a real-time clock, also missing. The microbit delivers little power. Additional components such as relays which permit external power sources without damaging the microbit are essential. And so the greenhouse operator knows what the system is doing. Information must be written to, uh, in this case an LCD display, or may even be radioed or internet linked to other devices. In a nutshell, a firm grasp of basic electronics and communications is essential to completing this project. Once she has chosen the equipment, she must design and test the circuits and understand how to connect or interface them to the microbit. The nature of the devices and their method of connection determines key aspects of the code. The red star is axiomatic. The system must be built and tested before coding. The greenhouse example shows that the electronically controlled devices filling our homes and our lives consist of two separate intimately linked systems, the electronic and or the electromechanical hardware and the microcontroller and its program. One is useless without the other and hardware comes first. Coding only takes place, can only take place 
when the input-output, the nature of the links to the outside world, is known. The stumbling block to mass classroom facilitation has always been the need for a wide range of essential skills, many outside the traditional curriculum, and therefore unfamiliar to most teachers. In addition, the inability of those charged with educational administration at the highest level to understand the detailed issues compounded the problem. The term coding is itself symptomatic. It suggests the encoding of pre-written text, in this case a set of instructions, whereas programming is about realising real-world actions in a computer language, something rather different and much more complex. And programmes must be effectively and robustly organised, while also operating efficiently. All but the simplest programmes demand careful preparation before the writing of instructions, considering important issues such as what's the best method for handling the processing, typically known as the algorithm, what's the best way of internally storing the data, and so on. Understanding the data is important too. All processor data is stored as binary numbers. In this area of IT, an understanding of basic arithmetic and logic using binary numbers is essential. For example, a digital thermometer transmits a temperature as a 16-digit binary number. Does it send the most significant or least significant byte first? Depending on the context, the example above could represent 65,533 or minus 3 in our deanery or base 10 number system. And then, how is that collection of bytes converted into the form needed by the programming language? On top of all that, when working with electronic components, it is essential to have enough basic knowledge to read their data sheets and understand how they present data. Potential difference, that is voltage, charge, current and resistance, are key concepts, without which even simple designs, interfacing an LED to a computer's digital output, reduces to painting by numbers, finding someone else's solution which may or may not be correct. During the last decade, the absence of expert classroom facilitation made the internet an increasingly useful information source and an equally useful cop-out of government responsibility. Yet, as this well-intentioned video sadly demonstrates, the need for a critical mass of knowledge and understanding, even when dealing with the simplest of situations, in this case connecting an LED to a microbit, is essential. Let's watch this brief video. First of all, I'm just going to show you how to connect uh, one LED. And then if you want to create uh, more LEDs, then I'll do that in a, a separate video for you. So firstly, you have a battery pack and inside there are two AAA batteries. And that on the end of it has a little connector. And it goes in only one way. So if you look at your micro bit on your micro bit, You've got two buttons on the front, you've got little lights, you've also got uh, different holes along the bottom. And the aim is for you to, you'll see there's a little uh, groove there. If you plug in your, your lead into the same bit, so it'll only go one way around and you can see it slots in there. So that's that. Bit. On the back, uh, you've got a button that you can press for reset. So if you need to reset, you can press that button. So now our power's connected. So the next thing you need is your positive lead. So this one, one end is your crocodile clip, which opens, and the other end is what's called a banana clip. And you'll see that it's a little bit different. And this end here goes into the micro bit and you can push it in and it snaps in. The other end, the negative end, is gonna go into this one that says G, N, D. And so you're gonna what's called earth the connection. So you're gonna basically take it in a circuit. So the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get my LED. Now, this LED is a flashing LED. It's a blue one. Uh, you can see on the top that it's like a hexagonal around the outside, a little bit like a diamond. And it's got one leg longer than the other. If I put them together, you can see that one leg is actually shorter than the other. And the longest leg is the positive. So I'm gonna connect the long leg up to my positive. Fiddly. and I'm going to bend them away a little bit from each other 
so that they don't get damaged. Now, if you're mounting these to your hovercraft, all you need to do first is poke them through the foam first so that they're on the, on the hovercraft and then you can clip your wires underneath. I'll leave it with you how you do it and then the negative goes on as well. Some of the important issues are, one, never apply or connect power while circuit building. Power should be switched on following construction and most important, then only after a careful construction check. In this video, the battery, to the best of my knowledge, has no power switch and the micro bit is powered from the moment of connection. Wrong or accidental connections can destroy components, even at low voltages. Two, the construction method. Using connectors that can easily and accidentally touch is prone to short circuiting and component damage. Three, LEDs must not be connected directly to their power source. In this case, an easily damaged microbit output. Once the potential difference of voltage across an LED exceeds its forward or switch on voltage, its internal resistance falls dramatically, potentially allowing it to pass enough current to damage the microbit or any other microcontroller. Hang on! Everything worked, didn't it? In this case, the teacher was lucky. Blue LEDs have a relatively large forward voltage, typically around 3 volts, which is about the same as the microbit's logic 1 output, and there was insufficient additional potential to deliver a damaging current. A circuit using a red LED with a lower forward voltage instead may be less fortunate. Generally, never drive an LED without a load or current limiting resistor. The point of all this? A basic platform of knowledge and understanding is essential to making safe, independent and robust progress. Let's examine the behaviour of the LED using a circuit simulator. The main display is divided effectively into two parts. A simple sequence of instructions which will be applied to the microcontroller which is represented by this rectangular green block. In this case, um, it happens to emulate a pickaxe microcontroller, but it could just as easily be a microbit. The only part of the microcontroller which is of any importance to us is the single output here, which is connected directly to the LED, the LED in turn being connected to zero volts. The program will eventually turn this output zero on. What the microcontroller does with this turn on instruction is to put five volts instead of zero volts on this line and that five volts of course is transferred directly along this piece of wire to the LED. So without any further ado let's start the program. Output zero is turned off, delay for two seconds, output zero is turned on and goodness me, we have a problem. We have a hazard sign here. Exploded part. Well, uh, LEDs don't usually explode, but they can easily burn out. Uh, more important in a circumstance like this, it may well be the microcontroller's output, which can only supply a limited amount of current, which may burn out and become useful, useless in future. The problem with the LED is that um, it has a very high resistance when it's out, when it's off. When enough voltage is applied to it, a sufficiently high potential, the LED will turn on. At that point, its ability to become conduct current is very, very good. Uh, we would say its internal resistance falls very, very quickly to zero, and the LED will try to take as much current as it can, in this case, from the poor, unfortunate microcontroller. So, how can we prevent this from happening? Well, first of all, we have to fix this part, so we'll click the spanner, and we'll now break this connection here, and go to our parts list, and bring over a resistor, and this will oppose, or imp rather impede, uh, or obstruct the flow of electrical current, and I'm very protective with my LEDs, 
and even more so my microcontrollers so I will put in a value here which will guarantee this LED will operate safely under this situation in this situation so let us now complete the circuit and run our program again delay for two seconds output on and the LED lights safely and then turns off after another two seconds what do we learn from this well a very important practical point never connect an LED directly to a power source always put in a resistance of sufficient value to allow the LED to shine brightly or as brightly as you want it but without sufficient current passing through it to damage it or the microcontroller or both Perhaps surprisingly, cost is not a barrier to classroom facilitation. Electronic components are often remarkably inexpensive, especially in comparison with many other classroom and workshop consumables. Even the associated computers, such as the microbit or the pickaxe, cost only a handful of dollars. A distinct advantage over the original BBC Micro, which, despite its many excellent qualities, was admittedly relatively expensive for its time. So what is the problem? All around computer literacy won't generally come about until it happens in the classroom. The essential ingredient for classroom success, of course, is the teacher. Enable teachers and it will happen. Sadly, control technology, knowledge and understanding occupies areas well outside the traditional curriculum and also outside many teachers' experiences. Maybe this was not understood by government. A distinct possibility because most career politicians, both here and abroad, are often competent IT users, but with little understanding of its inner workings. Maybe it was understood by government, which then balked at the cost of mass training programmes. Yet such programmes are required for both trainee and in-service teachers if their students are to confidently face an electro-technological future. If there is sufficient interest, Austec will provide free interactive online tutorials, beginning with an introduction to the system and how to work with it. Each extensible tutorial relates to a specific classroom project accompanied by a from square one or carry on from where you left off technological and arithmetic backgrounder. Each tutorial will have three sections. One, circuit design, build and test. Two, programming and finally, complete system test. Of course, all accompanied by fault finding, which is almost inevitable. Projects will be multi-platform using either the pickaxe, the microbit or the Raspberry Pi where appropriate. For further information, please email jamelia at yahoo.com and also check out the Microbit Facebook page for advanced microcontroller ideas.